So welcome to Magnetic Resonance in Medicine Highlights version 2.0. Uh, for four years, we have been publishing uh, blog posts uh, with interviews uh, of, with the authors of the editor's picks, and then these would get published as uh, uh, HTML file on our highlights portal, and then we would have these companion pieces uh, that uh, were audio slides uploaded on our YouTube channel. And with time, we realized that the blog posts uh, had a pretty short half-life. They would be very popular for about a week, and then they would kind of fade into obscurity. But the YouTube channel actually had staying power, people liked going back to the videos and they felt like this is a good way to get the entire paper in a small multimedia format. So starting with this interview today, uh, we are moving to a YouTube only format. And uh, I have the pleasure of being joined by Damien McHugh and Jeff Parker, uh, who will be our guinea pigs for uh, this first YouTube only highlights Q&A. So Damien and Jeff, uh, welcome. And maybe we can start with Damien. Uh, what, what made you join uh, the Parker Lab? Uh, well, it started in the last year of my uh, undergraduate physics degree, where Jeff um, and uh, another colleague in the department were lecturing a medical physics, a medical imaging uh, course. And uh, I took that and just got really interested in, in all aspects of medical physics and imaging in particular. And how long ago was that? Nine years ago, I think. Cool. And then during that course, um, PhD uh, position was advertised, and uh, I then applied for that and kind of been working with Jeff ever since then. So you still continue to work, even though now you're in Manchester and uh, Jeff is in London? Yes, yes. So we're still, um, so I spend half of my time working on a project specifically with Jeff and then the other half at the moment um, is still is still linked to Jeff, yeah. And how about you, Jeff? How did I get into MRI? Yeah. Um, so actually, someone asked me this question yesterday. I realised how long it is since I got into MRI. It's about 25 years, which shocks me, a quarter of a century. Um, so I, I got into MRI completely by accident. When, when doing my undergraduate degree, I really had no idea what I wanted to do afterwards. Um, and I just came across a poster advertising... PhDs at the Institute of Cancer Research in London um, and, and applied um, very speculatively um, and was fortunate enough to, to get the, um, the studentship with um, uh, a guy called Steve Tanner and Martin Leach, who, uh, and they were my supervisors. Um, and so that, that was the beginning, really, and that was a, that was a PhD in uh, cancer MRI focusing on dynamic contrast enhanced MR. Um, so yeah, a quarter of a century ago. It seems like a long time. And since then, you've been moving around a little bit. You just started a new position. After my PhD, I, I, um, I actually moved to UCL in London, University College London, and worked at the Institute of Neurology there. Um, and then I moved to Manchester back in 2000 um, and was there right up until the end of March this year. Um, and now I've moved back to UCL, so I'm back in London. Um, and so I'm now part of the Centre for Medical Image Computing um, uh, at UCL um, and also spend quite a lot of my time again back at the Institute of Neurology. So I've, I've done a circle. I'm back to where I started. Uh, what would be your ideal ISMRM location? Where would you like to take the conference? Well, I, I, can, I, I can give you my opinion on where I don't think it should be, you know, where, where, it, should, where it should not go to. Um, it's really become quite um, a high-profile thing in the UK to consider our, our carbon footprint um, generally in life. And I think we need to think hard about how that extends to conference attendance. Um, so my, my, my wish is that the ISMRM gives up going to um, Hawaii. I think um, cho choosing a location which guarantees that virtually every attendee has to travel for thousands of miles is not, not great policy. Um, so thinking hard about minimising the carbon footprint of the ISMRM is going to influence my choice of attending the conference in future. How about you, Damien? Any thoughts on where you'd like to go or, or not go? Yeah, I mean, I was pretty much going to say the same thing as Jeff, actually, in that um, this does seem to be growing as an area of, um, of consideration in terms of minimising long-distance air travel. So, 
moving towards something where remote participation is um, is feasible um, and works well is is something I would generally like to see. Um, yeah, I was pretty much going to say exactly the same thing as Jeff. I guess we're going to move on to the uh, paper that was selected as an editor's pick. Um, and the name of the paper is Toward a Resolution Limit for Diffusion-Weighted MRI Tumor Microstructural Models. Uh, what I would like to ask is first for Damien to give us a brief overview of what the paper is about. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we'll just do some follow-up questions before we move on to the audio slides. So the kind of the motivation for the work came from the lack of specificity that apparent diffusion coefficient measurements give and really wanting to explore the um, added information that we can get by using microstructural models and specifically um, for this paper looking at if we can use the microstructural models to um, distinguish between different um, changes that may occur in tumor tissue for example, um, in response to treatment or over time. And the resolution limit part of it is really referring to um, asking the question if the precision with which we can estimate the model parameters is sufficient in order to be able to detect the sorts of changes that we expect tumors to undergo. And I have to say, this, this paper has everything I want to see in a paper because uh, uh, it, it's it's um, trying to set some standards and proper uh, quality control procedures for making sure we interpret microstructural imaging data properly. Uh, it introduces the right statistics to actually be able to tell, can we tell a difference uh, uh, in, in uh, cell death and cell size reduction? And then it's, it's somewhat of a negative result because the conclusion is not on clinical scanners. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes. So, I mean, there, there are going to be some caveats to that, but the, the kind of overall finding was the, the difficulty of detecting um, the reasonably subtle changes in cell size um, that are characteristic of, of cells undergoing apoptosis, for example. And we do kind of make the point that the simulation paper that the simulations that the paper is based around does give a sort of best case scenario in a lot of um, in a lot of ways. For example, in terms of some of the fitting, um, in terms of the just the controllability that we have over the simulation. So, in in practical situations, it's probably going to be be more difficult. Well, I, I was just going to say, particularly for the radius, you know, the the, um, the the cell density information. I think there is more of a a fighting chance that we. Yeah. Could that um, reliably on, on clinical scanners, but when it comes to cell cell radius and change in cell radius, I agree it, it's um, it's probably beyond current capabilities in terms of signal to noise ratio and the sequences that we have. Today. Yeah, and again, there will probably be some variation there with depending on the the site of the tumor and maybe the tumor type that. Um, in some cases, SNR may inherently be better than others, depending on the T two of the tissue. Um, but yeah, that was the, the sort of broad conclusion. So how, how good a scanner would it take then to actually be able to do this uh, clinically? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, we did look at gradient strengths going up to 300 millitesla per meter, and there are situations in which that um, offers benefits. So particularly with looking um, at estimating changes in small cells. So the higher gradient strength is obviously beneficial there. One of the things that we didn't look at in the paper was um, other potential acquisitions and uh, the benefits that that may bring. Um, so we focused on PGSE, but obviously things like um, double diffusion encoding or OGSE, these sequences may um, be able to, to offer benefits, um, but that's something that we haven't explored at the moment. And the other thing I noticed is that your lab actually maintains a software page where you uh, share a lot of the code as supplement to your papers. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, your acknowledgments say that analysis code will be made available. But as far as I saw, you have made some code from previous papers available, but not for this one. That's true. Yeah, that hasn't gone up yet. That's in, that's the intention is that it will go up, but partly with Jeff moving to UCL, that page isn't quite as up to date as it could be. But yeah, the intention is that the code um, for all, all of the code that was used in the paper will eventually go up onto the that QBI code website. 
And thanks yes. for the prompt. I think we uh, we need to get back to doing that. Yes. Make sure it's up we there. do. No, I, I, I think, I really hope that MRM will make a push for reproducibility in the coming years. And uh, I, I find that this is really essential for the advancement of the field. So we're actually uh, thinking of reviving uh, MR Hub, but uh, less as a repository for software and more as a dynamic environment where people can uh, uh, submit supplementary information and supplementary materials. So I was very happy to see that your lab is already doing that and maybe we can centralize it uh, and encourage other people to do I so. I think there are, some, there are some real benefits to that sort of centralization. You know, as Damien mentioned, just the fact of me moving the institution creates a barrier, um, which, which highlights the, the problems with sustaining um, lab-based material. You know, it only lasts as long as as the lab or the person that's controlling the web page has the inclination to keep it going. So something that's more centralized may be quite helpful, I think. So thank you very much. I guess now we can move on to the audio slide part. And uh, Damien, uh, if you could just give us a brief spiel, walk us through the slides, yeah. uh, and uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll interject with some questions, okay. or maybe you'll just do one dry run, and uh, we'll keep that for the interview. Mm -hmm. So Damien, if you could uh, start the audio slides, looking forward to seeing more about your work. Okay, I'll just give a brief walkthrough of the, the recent MRM paper. Um, and as I briefly mentioned, the kind of main motivation was the lack of, speci lack of specificity from ADC measurements alone, in that they can't distinguish between different microstructural changes that tumors may undergo. For example, uh, cell shrinkage, where the cell density remains constant, which, for example, may ha happen in apoptosis, or a case where the cell size remains constant um, with cell density decreasing, so having a loss of cells. So just to illustrate this, um, if we start from a baseline situation where the tissue is modeled as spherical cells with a given radius and volume fraction, uh, we have uh, an ADC that we measure with the standard clinical protocol. If we then consider two different changes from this baseline, in the first case, cell density remains constant, but there's a reduction in cell size, we get an ADC increase. And if we consider the second um, situation where the cell density decreases, but the cells remain the same size, we also have an ADC increase. So simply seeing that ADC goes up doesn't allow us to determine uh, which of these two situations has occurred. So if we use a microstructural model and can actually estimate the parameters such as cell radius and volume fraction directly, we'd be able to tease these situations apart. So this might resolve some of the ambiguity in ADC measurements and give more specific information about cellular level changes that occur in tumors. And in order to do this, um, the feasibility depends on two factors. So the first is the accuracy and precision of the model estimates which depends on the acquisition, potentially the tissue properties themselves and the SNR. Uh, and it also depends on the magnitude of the specific biological changes. So the work in the paper is really looking at the link between these two different factors and how this impacts the feasibility um, of using the models to detect or to distinguish between specific changes. So just to show what that kind of looks like, if we consider um, theoretical um, histograms of our parameters. So for the radius and the volume fraction, for the baseline case in blue and the, the changed case um, in, in yellow here, we're looking to see if we can have sufficiently precise estimates of the radius that we can distinguish between these cases and the same for the volume fraction. And one of the specific questions we can ask in this setting is can we detect apoptotic cell shrinkage with standard um, clinical acquisitions. So I'll just give a, a brief overview of the methods um, and leave the details for, for the paper. Um, but we start by simulating noisy signals for a range of different tumor microstructures, a range of acquisitions, and a range of signal to noise ratios. For those noisy signals, we then fit our model and evaluate the accuracy and precision of the model parameters, allowing us to ask if the accuracy and precision varies depending on the tissue properties, the acquisition, or the SNR. 
using that precision um, from the simulations, we can then compare that with the magnitude of the parameter change that we expect and see if the precision of our estimates is sufficient to detect the change. And from this, we can infer if the SNR, uh, we can infer the SNR needed to detect a given change to ultimately see if the approach is feasible. And these last two points um, I will describe a in a little bit more detail. So in terms of the um, comparison of precision with magnitude of change, we define the ability to detect change using a two sample Z test. So we're looking at the um, standard error on our two parameter estimates and comparing this with the magnitude of the change in the parameter. So this P can either be the radius or the volume fraction and the one and two subscripts refer to the the two situations that we have. So for example, the baseline case and the changed case. And we use simulations to see how SNR affects these standard errors. And then we infer the SNR that we need to detect a given change. And we do this by fitting um, an expression to our resolution limits, which is the left-hand side of our equation uh, inequality here and then interpolate and extrapolate this to a wider range of SNRs than the subset that we simulate. And then we look for the intersection of these fitted curves with the detection threshold, which depends on the magnitude of the parameter change, ultimately allowing us to infer the minimum SNR that we need to detect a given change. And I'll kind of walk through that process um, with a specific example in the results. So jumping onto the first bit of results where we looked at the accuracy and precision of the radius and volume fraction estimates as a function of the ground truth. So we're looking here specifically at one acquisition, an optimized acquisition for 80 millitesla per meter gradients, where we plot the accuracy and precision in our estimates of radius as a function of ground truth radius along the y-axis and ground truth volume fraction along the x-axis. And we can also do that for the volume fraction estimates. And just pulling out some of the, the observations from the plots, we see that the radius and volume fraction tend to be underestimated at high values of the radius. So these blue regions um, for the large cells and overestimated at the low radius values. So these um, uh, yellow regions um, along the, the low, the, the small cells. We also see that the accuracy and precision for the radius tends to improve with volume fraction. So as we move from low volume fractions to high volume fractions, um, we tend to get an improved precision. And we also see that the volume fraction precision tends to be better at low volume fractions. So these blue regions on the left here. We can also do the same thing for a, a higher signal to noise ratio. And as we expect, we generally see an improvement in the accuracy um, and uh, an increase in the precision as well, as we'd expect from the higher signal to noise ratio. So the general take home message here is that the accuracy and precision of the model parameters depends on a number of factors, including the specific microstructural properties themselves, the acquisition protocol that we use and the SNR. And this is potentially important to consider um, in, for example, tracking tumours over time, as it suggests that depending on the ground truth tissue microstructure, we're going to have better or worse accuracy and precision on our estimates. And if the tumour microstructure is changing over time, then our accuracy and precision may, may change over time as well. So just to go back to the um, specific example um, where we're looking at detecting apoptotic cell shrinkage and the histograms that we saw before, we can then compare that with the histograms that we get from the simulations. So for a lower SNR case on the top row and a higher SNR case on the bottom row. And I'll just give a, a qualitative interpretation of these histograms to start with. So when we have uh, the lower SNR case, we can see that there's quite a large overlap in the histograms between the two different cell radius estimates, suggesting that we're not going to be able to distinguish those. However, for the volume fraction, there's a reasonable separation, suggesting that we can detect that change in volume fraction. 
When we move to the higher SNR case, we can see the precision of our radius estimates increases to such an extent that we could probably distinguish these, these radii. And for the volume fraction, the case um, is even better than before, and there's clear separation, so we could detect those changes. Can do the same thing for the, um, the second case, where the cell density decreases, except here there's no change in radius for us to be able to detect. And as before, the change in volume fraction can be detected because our precision is good enough. So moving on from that qualitative interpretation, um, the next bit was kind of looking at that resolution limit in order to quantify our ability to detect the changes. And we do that by looking at the precision of our estimates. So here we plot the precision of our radius and volume fraction as a function of SNR for our three different microstructures. So the baseline microstructure in blue, um, the cell shrinkage case in yellow, and the cell density decrease in red. And then we use this precision along with this inequality that we saw before to then generate um, this plot of um, the resolution limit as a function of SNR. And I'll just walk through how we move from these plots on the left to this plot here. So we start by taking our standard error of our parameter estimates, in this case, the radius at baseline, and the, the equivalent standard error for the um, change case. And then this gives us our resolution limit, which we plot um, as the X symbols here and fit the one over SNR limit, which uh, the one over SNR expression, which we can see fits well. And then we look at where this intersects with the, um, the threshold, which is determined by the magnitude of the parameter change. And we can read off from this intersection what the SNR is that we would need in order to detect this change. We can do the same thing for the volume fraction. And here we see that the intersection occurs at a lower SNR. So in the first case, we needed an SNR of around 50. And in the second case, we need an SNR of around 15. We can do exactly the same thing for the, the second change where the cell density decreases. And again, there's no change in radius, so we have no intersection to detect. Whereas for the volume fraction, um, the situation is very similar to the first case, um, and the, the, volume, the, the SNR needed is around 50. So in this one specific example, we've seen that the sensitivity to detecting a change in radius needs around a threefold higher SNR than for detecting the volume fraction. So much of the, the rest of the work in the paper was sort of generalizing um, this observation and considering a wider range of volume, for, uh, a wider range of um, ground truth microstructures and a wider range of acquisitions. So that's summarized in this somewhat busy plot here, where we're considering the SNR that we need to detect the change in radius in um, the X symbols and volume fraction in the circles for different um, baseline radius values and for different combinations of the diffusivities. And in general, we see here that the X's tend to lie above the um, circles, which matches the previous observation that generally we need a higher SNR to detect the radius value in comparison to the volume fraction. And the one situation where that's not necessarily true is for this combination of diffusivities where the intracellular diffusivity is higher than the extracellular diffusivity. And we also consider different um, acquisitions. So optimized acquisitions on the top row, non-optimized acquisitions on the bottom row, and for different maximum gradient strengths as shown in the panel. And again, the take home message here is that for a reasonably wide range of plausible baseline microstructures, as well as different acquisition protocols, we see that we need a higher SNR for detecting a change in radius than a change in volume fraction. So just to conclude, given the relative changes in radius and volume fraction as a result of apoptosis, we generally see that changes, detecting changes in R needs a higher SNR than detecting changes in volume fraction. 
meaning that in our typical clinical setting, it's going to be challenging to detect apoptotic cell size decreases. And kind of more generally, um, it's going to be important to understand the SNR requirements for detecting specific microstructural changes. And this should really be considered before planning experimental studies to know if the um, precision with which we expect to estimate our model parameters is going to be enough to tease out the changes that we might expect to see in, in, in tissue. And again, more generally moving on from just diffusion modeling, um, it's important to compare the magnitude of expected biological changes with the accuracy and precision of measurements from any MR model really. And this is important um, part of the validation process for using these measurements as potential biomarkers. So it kind of sums up the paper and I'll just finish by thanking uh, the funders and um, for the help given um, by IT services at the University of Manchester. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you for the interesting conversation. And we look forward to seeing you in Montreal at the Highlights After Party. Great. Very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thanks, Nicola.